you're a, a Belfast girl. Yes, I am indeed. I uh, was brought up in both off the Anderson's Town Road and off the Antrim Road. So I went to school here and I used to attend a little drama class on a Saturday afternoon with a very nice woman called Mae Marin and I think a lot of people went to her. Um, so I suppose I got a, a bit of a taste for acting at those little classes. Um, although it was not something that I was really thinking of doing as a, for a long time as a, as a serious uh, profession. Yeah, your degree was in, was it English and French? It, you was, did your it in? was indeed, yeah. But when I left Queen's, I didn't really know what I was going to do. And I had a notion of writing, but very quickly discovered I didn't have the self-discipline. <laughs> and I just thought I'd travel um, and uh, found that didn't sustain me either. So I'd ha I thought I'd have a go at acting just to see how far I could get. And uh, just for a sense of adventure, really. And... Uh, I started with a theatre company in England called the National Student Theatre Company and went to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in a new play by a student. And, um, and it was while I was there, I saw a production by Jim Sheridan of a Yeats play um, that was done by the Project Arts Centre in Dublin. Um, I had a, at that point enrolled for a drama college to see if I could uh, learn something. It was in, in London, and I very quickly discovered it was bogus. And in fact, I was going to learn nothing. And um, I, I stayed a little while longer than I should have for the novelty value, in fact, and just the interesting people who were there, all of whom were being ripped off and made fools of <laughs> but, uh, from various parts of the world. <laughs> and, um, but like all misadventures, I think the best thing to get out of it is a good friend. So I have a good Polish friend who I met then. And she was only at that college because she wanted to be in England because she was madly in love with John Lennon. <laughs> and, and actually, you know, she, it was before Poland was part of the European Union and uh, she hung on as long as she could at that drama college just so she could be close to John Lennon <laughs> even though he wasn't living there. But she remains a friend, so I left that place. And uh, Jim Sheridan, I wrote to him um, very cheekily to say how much I'd enjoyed that production and how I was interested in acting. And he wrote back... Uh, very charmingly and said if I was coming back to Belfast via Dublin to call in and see him before Christmas and I did that and um, so it, he was very open and very welcoming and that surprised me that that you could that could happen in the theatre I didn't think that you uh, would yeah. meet an open door like that and I love I that that you just you know you wrote a letter you created mm. an opportunity for yourself and he responded which was the best part because yeah. we were, were speaking you're not from an acting family but you are from a very well-known Belfast family. <laughs> well, my father <laughs> ran a pub down at the docks called Pat's Bar, and uh, which he ran for years. And um, when people would ask him how I happened to be an actor and nobody else in the family w acted, and he said, sure haven't I been acting for years behind this bar. <laughs> um, but he was a bit of an actor, actually, because we used to have a wonderful photograph of him, like a sepia photograph of three boys, one with a wonderful sort of fedora hat and holding a dagger like that. And uh, there was a barrel and a, another child, another boy with a crown, a paper crown on his head with his hands up. And then another boy on the other side. And this was from a, a play that my father was in in Banlasloe where he came from, On the Fair Green, that they had written in Irish about King James being found in the barrel. And um, they performed it on the Fair Green in Banlasloe, and we had this wonderful photograph of him with great drama in his face and holding this this knife. We're we're going to see a clip now from Maeve, which I know that despite the fact that probably been one of your your first sort of big productions, it's one of the ones that you're you're most proud of, and has really stood the test of time. Because I was catching up on on these things last night and today. Um, it's beautifully, beautifully written, and also I think it really sums up the sort of Belfast, the Northern Ireland of our youth. Yes. Um, hopefully the technicians are going to play the clip now. I think that what stands the test of time with that is first of all the writing because it sums up and I suppose at that stage it was almost like your journey. You know, you go away to London, you go away to a big city, you see that feminism and, and um, women's rights and equality have moved on so much and then you come back to what and I'm not sure whose words I'm stealing when I say this but I have quoted it many times but we were living in an armed patriarchy and that's exactly what this place was and the writing in that really captured that it captured conflict it captured the fact that we were living in a very fundamentalist and backward place um, and it, it captured that sort of battle between women and the society that they were living in and um, 
Yes, and also uh, one of the things that really appealed to me about that story was about, uh, because it essentially it was about a, a young woman who leaves her community, her family and her community, and um, goes to London um, and comes back and her sister has remained with the family and the community. And it, it's something very close to my heart because I feel that once you take a step away from your community and family and you know go into exile, whatever you want to call it, or that you, I certainly will feel um, forever divided and, and split between um, that that community you left and where you now are, and you know you might have wanted to, uh, you know, take on different aspects of life and move away, but you will. I I don't feel you ever really settle to um, that other life. There's always something pulling at you, um, and I felt very strongly in this film because the sisters, the sister I played, Roisin, and then Maeve. Um, verbalized that or discussed that conflict and um, my character was remaining very faithful to her mother and very understanding of what her mother faced, uh, how she lived her life and wasn't so willing to condemn her mother's uh, position in that society and how she saw things, was much more uh, sympathetic towards it and I like that that was um, articulated in this film, the, those conflicting uh, views of community and life and I certainly have enormous respect and um, admiration for people who live in the community and remain there and make the best of it and make it better yeah. um, and uh, I, I'm very drawn to those stories where people leave and, and, and then uh, feel very divided and, and I, I, another film I had a small part in Brooklyn um, when I read that book, I, I was very moved by that, that, that once that young woman, Eilish, went to New York, she was effectively split in, in two with her loyalties to her family back in Wexford and then her new family in New York. And this, that is articulated as well, I think, in yeah. Maeve. And, uh, but also, I think it was, that film was excellent. It was beautifully shot, but it was excellent in capturing what it was like on the streets. And even here. getting that film made at that time, I know that it was you know, made on a shoestring, wasn't it? It was incredibly low budget. It was. But the, the writing was crucial, crucial to do all the parts in it, especially that, that um, relationship between the two sisters. Yes, uh, Pat Murphy had that story. She wrote, she'd spent part of her childhood, in fact, her teen years in Belfast and was at school here. Um, and uh, she'd been at the Royal College uh, of Art Film School and um, with John Davies and uh, Rob Smith, who were also at that college with her, she'd shown them the script and they went to the BFI uh, with the script and then suddenly, d thinking they'd say no. And when they said yes, they suddenly found they would be making a film in Belfast and uh, I think threw themselves into it with some passion and uh, enthusiasm. And it was the first film I ever did it was filmed, was it in the Armour Road or around in there? Was uh, that where yes, all around the markets and various places at the Green Briar <laughs> of the Glen Road. I remember we had a scene up there and <laughs> it was in various parts of, of, uh, of Belfast. Um, but it was wonderful because it was a low budget film. It was wonderful being so close to the heart of the film to be brought into that, uh, that little uh, grouping making the film and to get so close to it. I, I have wonderful memories of that. And then did the Billy plays come quite soon after that or when? Yes, oh, immediately afterwards the first uh, play for today was Too Late to Talk to Billy by Graham Reid. And again, I think that was somebody from Belfast who really knew his stuff. He knew what he was writing. He knew about family and um, he knew, and obviously on his ear he had a Belfast wit. Um, and, uh, but he was also very influenced by theatre, uh, Graham. He talked about O'Casey and... Um, the wonderful Irish theatre that was part of, part of our heritage. Um, but he really knew what he was writing about. He knew he was writing about family and he knew family. And we, you know, we all know family, we'll have a sense of that. Um, but it's interesting because you were talking about watching them again. And um, I watched them all again about four or five years ago. And I had not really taken in quite how violent they were. I mean, we're all quite inured to violence in films, but that because it was so much a part of violence in a family um, I find quite disturbing, but it was very, very real. Yeah. 
and they were very political and controversial for that time. You don't probably realise till you watch them back at that stage, there was nothing like that had ever been on TV before and probably for quite a period after those those plays were were, um, were shown on TV, there was nothing. For years, yeah. and I think they were, they were so popular, I think people really responded and related to them and recognised um, so much. Of it. But again, within that, um, the whole sort of uh, thing about domestic violence um, was very on the nose. It wasn't, uh, Graham didn't pull any punches about that at all. And um, I, uh, watching it again, I remembered the sort of almost physical uh, sensation of getting between Jimmy Ellis and Ken Branagh as the sister in the family and trying to keep them separate, you know, with the, like stags uh, locking horns. And even in that, in that tiny little space, which was our uh, house and studio, um, I actually felt quite frightened, you know, physically, yeah. because they were so big and so angry and thinking, God, that would take something to, you know, yeah. keep two people like that apart. And your your little sister, Anya Gorman, from the says in the, the audience, and you, yes. you were telling me beforehand that you um, had told, like, a slight little white lad about your age. Was it before you took <laughs> I that? I wasn't telling, that's <laughs> acting, you know, I was, I think I was 27, and I was... Uh, Pretending to be 18, I was supposed yeah. to be their 18-year-old <laughs> sister, and <laughs> Anya and Tracy were so smart and so brilliant, but I was waiting on being exposed to anyone, <laughs> and mocked mercilessly. It didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you mentioned Brooklyn there, and funny enough, today before I came to speak to you, I had asked on you because she was the only person I knew that knew you, and she had said, "Ask her about Brooklyn. It's great." And I'm going to quote her. She said, "She plays an old bitch in it." <laughs> <laughs> it's because I am an old bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and um, somebody af after that asked me, sent me a little message, um, and said. Uh, God, whoever you were channeling, I, I, I wouldn't like to meet them. And I said, I wasn't channeling anybody. Uh, uh, yes, no, I, well, actually, when I read that book, I thought that was a really great character. They don't, you don't usually get the same context in a film that's usually reduced, yeah. but I, I enjoyed the idea of yeah. that character. Um, I suppose your most famous role is that of Agnes, and it's a role that you played for quite a, a long time, both on the stage and on the, the, the screen. I'm going to queue up the <laughs> clip again because I think we're going to see a clip obviously from the film of Dancing at Lunas and that's going to be shown I hopefully quite soon. Um, as we say Agnes was your most famous role you won a Tony Award for Agnes on the stage. Were you worried then when that role was going to be transferred onto the big screen when um, you thought Harbour was translate into a, a film? Uh, I was a bit um I was about because uh, I've been doing it in the theatre for nearly two years, and I sort of felt that it might be too um, for me. You know, the lines are too hackneyed. Too, I'd be too used to them, and maybe not find a spontaneity that you can otherwise find. You know, when you just come to a film fresh, um, and also I was worried about how it would translate from uh, stage to to screen. Uh, it it. It was such a beautifully written piece and um, written for theatre and um, by a master playwright. I, I, I sort of exquisitely written with a wonderful theatrical masterstroke of the dance very early on, the wild dance. Um, so it, I wasn't sure that it would suit cinema. Um, it's very different. Uh, and also I, d I wasn't sure I'd be in that when it came to cinema. I know that when we were on Broadway, um, in, on Broadway, there would be in the green room, there was a notice saying Ballybeg Celebrity Alert, which was the name of, <laughs> you know, sort of really well known people who were in that night. I never looked at it, but I believe there'd be a lot of people coming in, and particularly uh, Hollywood actresses who had their own production companies, because clearly they'd heard there was going to, there was this play with all these women, you know, parts for women, which is very unusual, and um, they coming in with an eye on a film. Uh, so, you know, Barbara Streisand and all these people would turn up and so we, myself and the others in uh, that great ensemble, um, Dancing Luna, so we'd speculate about who would play our parts. Uh, you know, we'd have Goldie Hawn playing somebody <laughs> and, you know, playing <laughs> Maggie and I don't know, various people <laughs> actually. It was close enough, you know, when it came to it. but. Um, uh, it, it it was it was a bit of a worry that it might be, and also when I first read that part of Agnes, she said so little. Really, and that was one of the only scenes where she yeah. says quite a lot. But she said so little. I thought, well, this is quite a hard thing to do on stage to sit there not saying anything for a long time. 
And I thought, oh, I, I think I know how to do this for camera. But actually, when it came to it, I thought, oh, I think, I don't know. Uh, you know, I just didn't want to sound it, make it sound like it was a piece of theatre. You know, I worried it might be too theatrical. The, the writing and that, as you said, Brian Fields, Fields' play is, is exquisite. And the fact that he gets those women, each one of their characters, is so intricate. It's explained so well. You feel like you really know who they are. Um, for a man who was writing female roles, he seemed to really get into the sort of psyche of those women, didn't he? Well, I think he knew them. He, um, he certainly, whether they were exactly the women that he'd known, who were his aunts who lived in Glenties, all together in the same house. Um, and he dedicated that play to those five brave Glenties women. Um, so he, and he directed from the page. You know, he, he described how each woman would dance. And um, he had spent his summers um, with those women. His mother would take him back and his father would go as well to spend the summer in Glenties with that family, with those sisters living together. And I, I think what was for me very strong in that play was they were a, an economic unit, those women. None of them were married and they, to survive, they relied on each other. Um, and Agnes, my character, and then Rosie, uh, who w was very close to me in the, that character, um, knitted socks, uh, or was it gloves? Mine looked like a sock because I couldn't <laughs> knit. It just went on and on and on. And uh, Bridge Nyokthan, who, who played Rosie with me, was a great knitter. And uh, I was supposed to be the best knitter in Ballybeg. And um, Brian's writing is very terse. You know, he writes exactly what he wants to, and there's not a, a, a bit of fat on it. Uh, but I, and I would, you'd never change anything, but I did say to him once, could you change that line about the best knitter in Ballybeg? Because it's very obvious I can't knit. And, so I knit a big long thing and then Bridge <laughs> Nocton would, she would <laughs> unravel it and, and <laughs> fix it for me a bit. So I think there were gloves, but mine looked more like socks or something. And, um, but it, it's when, they, when she hears about the proposed factory in the town, is a knitting factory coming. I think she realizes it's up for her. The, the home industry is about to end and she wouldn't be ready for that. Or she wouldn't be able for that type of um, mechanized work in the factory. She's too old for all that, and I think that's what makes her one of the things that causes her to leave with her sister and go to London. And also, when you're watching it back, obviously in a, in a modern context, when we talk about Maeve, that showed the sort of you know armed patriarchy, if you like, of of the North after partition. That play really sums up that sort of church-led patriarchy, where those women live such constrained lives. Absolutely, and. Um, and the fact that um, they had, that in that story, um, they, one of the sisters had an illegitimate child and that was a, obviously a stigma and they, were, they gathered round each other to protect um, her and the child. But also they had a brother, a priest, which again, then on the other hand, was um, you know, a, a real mark of honour and um, there was great pride in that. But, uh, obviously, they were very repressed by the state, by the church in particular, um, and I and I think also my character of Agnes possibly had a strong subversive streak. At least I like to think she did. <laughs> I, I certainly looked for it and found it, and that she couldn't, um, she couldn't deal with that anymore in the, the authoritarianism of her eldest sister, who represented, in fact, the sister Kate represented church and state and. Um, uh, Agnes, I think, uh, rebelled against that quietly and in the end just walked away. Yeah, it's, from it's it. so like Devil Ours Ireland, doesn't it? It's that, you know, really constraint, you know, women who were ashamed almost to, to have them to stay together and, and to live in that, that unit because society had yes. said, judged them as sort of spinster women who lived on their own. Yes, but, but Brian Friel, of course, wasn't afraid to. to uh, bring up the whole sort of paganism underlying all that just underneath the surface, the, the sort of pagan paganism and represented by that dance and the, the desire to dance and the, you know, um, it's not paganism, it's just life, yeah. but um, I know that line, I, I will still enjoy that line, I don't care how dirty and smelly <laughs> or whatever it is, sweaty they are, and I, I, I'm, my husband keeps bringing that up to me, telling me that that's... It's, it's, it's pretty yeah. much sums up how I felt after lockdown when they said the bars were going to open again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care, I'll just go anyway. Um, when, it, when you were um, in Broadway and you were guessing about which one of these actresses were going to play the roles, did anyone manage to win the bet with Meryl Streep? Or? Nobody mentioned, no, I didn't, <laughs> no because she didn't, she didn't come to see yeah. it then, she hadn't seen it. Uh, in fact, I don't know if she ever saw the play. Um, um, 
Uh, but I, I, I think you're, I, I was saying that to you earlier, that on our first day when we met for the film, um, I saw that we were gathered in a, uh, you know, some sort of reception we were meeting, and I, I had that thing of seeing this woman uh, just across the room, and um, I was just saying to you, my, my mother used to do that thing and when we'd be in the town, down the town, she'd go, I know that girl, and it could be a person <laughs> in their 60s or whatever, it was, it was a real Belfast thing, I know that girl, maybe from school or something, <laughs> and when I saw Merle, I thought, God, I know that girl there, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, the next thing she came across to me and just said, I'm going to be listening to you. <laughs> uh, and uh, she, 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 done, she said she hadn't seen it, and she, but she was very, she was very drawn to obviously the writing, but she has Irish ancestry, Donegal possibly, and she knows all the songs. She's got them all off, all yeah. the Irish songs. And, and you were the the only one of the sisters that made it from the stage production to the the screen production. Yes. Um, which was obviously, I suppose, a testament to how well you had played Agnes on the stage. I don't know. If, I don't know. If <laughs> I, th I mean, the, the the women I worked with in um, all of those actresses in were wonderful. They were brilliant, and it was a great ensemble, you know. And they really were brilliant. I can't say, I can't say why. I don't know why. I just, you know, that I think. Well, obviously, uh, what f film obviously will to get money to draw money, they will want to get a name, and they yeah. and. Um, my understanding is that the producer approached Meryl Streep at the Cannes Film Festival and asked her, would she do this? And obviously once he had Meryl on board, he could draw more money. Although what my understanding is from her as well, that things had taken a bit of a dip for her. So she was absolutely delighted at that point to get something really meaty and really good like that and uh, a very nice part. Yeah, and know. things have changed. We know things have changed since then and there are more diverse roles for women and especially for older women, um, but that play was one of the few probably productions at that time that had that almost all female cast, a cast of very sort of strong, complex women, um, and women of a certain age as well. Very definitely, and uh, it, it was, I think that's another reason why, I mean, apart from it being very well written, it was such a success everywhere in Europe, as far as I know. A friend of mine was in Barcelona, and he sent me a little photograph of um, it being done in Catalan in this theatre and it's done everywhere I think in Scandinavian countries and I think it was just the joy of having that many parts very hard to get for women in play. Yeah we're gonna see a clip of obviously what we're, we're here for um, Dunan is going to be your Ar the Irish language production which is going to be shown I think tomorrow night as part of the the film festival um, we'll see a clip of it now, but this is something that was obviously a bit of a lockdown project for you because you had to learn how to speak Irish or relearn how to speak Irish um, for for the role. I, I I never really could speak it. Well, <laughs> I'd been to the Gaelic talk actually, and I you know you you, were, you had to or you were told you had to speak it. Um, although I think a lot of people would have uh, how to make soda bread and Irish learnt off for when the priest pulled up in the car. <laughs> because mostly people that was the talk. I mean, mostly people I think did try to sp speak English. It was. But I, I suppose I had a certain degree, but it, it had all gone, it had disappeared, and I had an absolutely brilliant coach to help me with the lines uh, in um, Orlani Kharni. She uh, was fantastic. I don't know if I could have done without her. Yeah, so tell us about your, your Irish classes. Was it a, an online class you did? And I think it was reading, was it like Glen Colm Kill, or it was in the Gale Talk anyway? Um, no, uh, when um, Dermot and uh, uh, Michael from Double Band first came to me and asked me, did I have any Irish? I said very, very little, and then um, it was to, it was to be made um, the April before last, and um, but um, you know Damien McCann who directed yeah. it said he would you know we could help with the, but I just had to prepare two scenes to pass muster with um, uh, T.G. Cahar and I think the Irish department of the BBC here, um, and had it been had it gone ahead when it originally was supposed to. I would not have been as well prepared, <laughs> I suppose that's what, it, but then we had the first lockdown, so I had time to, I signed up to actually Duolingo in the first place, but then I also signed up to a Zoom course, beginner's course at Glen Column Killer, and, um, but that's when I thought, oh, I really need to learn this language, I need to relearn this language. You know. Yeah, I think we're going to see a, a clip of it now. So let's just uh, sort of slightly unpick the, the plot of this. Your character in this is a retired detective, are they? Yep. Uh, well, just a Bangarda, I yep. think. I don't think she had a very high rank. I, I mean, um, Damien McCann sent me a book um, before I, I did this, before we started filming. It was a very, very interesting book about a woman I in the Garda who um, had got pregnant. Uh, 
when she was first started as a guard. And talking about patriarchy and the treatment of women, this is some read. And he, Damien had sent it to me um, more for uh, just a background to think about this character and why this woman, a retired uh, Bangarda, was living on an island, supposedly somewhere like Tory off the Donegal coast, and why she lived this life there, uh, having been either sent there uh, 23 years or, or more before, or whether she had been become disgusted with how things were for her and the guards. And um, but it was a a really excellent book by the woman who experienced it was a, a you know a memoir of her experience in the guards and really worth reading um a real eye opener and it wasn't it didn't uh, it relate to the the film as such but it was a great background to think about why that woman was living on that island uh and why she was treated so badly by and the guards she did come into contact with and her indeed her whole take on on life why she was prepared to listen to the young woman in this Indian in the film, and why how she why she viewed life as she did, uh, so I, I thought that was a great piece of um, uh, background uh, uh, because there's not very much written about you. We don't know very much about Lisha, who, yeah. who the main character. Um, so it's all there to be filled in and to be sort of thought about it, just to keep bubbling under the surface. And when you first read the the script for the film, what was it that would have attracted you to, to that role? It was just a gr I was a great. I loved the story and the writing um, by Ashlyn Clark, uh, but it was just a woman of that age uh, with that wisdom and that um, watchfulness, and uh, her take on humanity is sort of quiet, but uh, not altogether um, uh, sort of uh, rosy view of the world um, and it just is it's just a gift for an actor to be offered something like that so I was very grateful to Dermot Lavery and Michael Hewitt and Damien McCann for taking a, a, an enormous leap of faith because I, I had so little Irish left um, and asking me to do it because it's one of the greatest challenges of this and it's one of those things where many times during my career I've really just been hanging on by my fingertips thinking, oh, I don't know how much longer I can do this, especially when my children were younger and I'm thinking, no, too many nights out at the theatre, too many, you know, too much time working. And um, But for things like this, I'm really glad I held on, but not, you know, not knowing, you never know what's around the corner, but this one was a real jewel. And you don't really see it in that clip, but it is beautifully shot, it's beautiful. the location yeah. where it is. Where was it actually filmed? All around Strangford Loch. Um, another reason I was very drawn to it was I, I never really knew that area. Uh, I went to a boarding school in Ballinahinch in County Down, and I, as a boarder, I found it quite traumatic. So it took me a long time to, t to actually go down that road again, uh, going on the way to County Down. And it's so beautiful. I've, um, I've now come to really appreciate how gorgeous it is. Uh, one of those scenes um, on the trailer is shot on Minerstown Beach on a freezing cold Saturday morning last November. And uh, I just could not get over the beauty of the place and the morns uh, just ahead of me. And it's a glorious area. So all around there, Killyleigh, uh, Miners Town, our glass, um, over in the Arts Peninsula as well, and up in Isla McGee, but all around, and very beautiful, and beautifully shot. And I, I suppose that sort of signifies that this renaissance that's happening now in, in Irish film and, and TV, and the fact that there is so many opportunities now which wouldn't have existed when you were younger. You had to go away, you had to go to London, or you had to go to Dublin, or you had to go somewhere else, whereas now there are so many opportunities, aren't there? The that fact that the film industry's... Yeah, you know so much has changed, obviously, uh, um, in the city, and uh, one of the... And in this part of the world, and one of the amazing things is the the film and television industry, and how there's a huge e um, expert trained workforce here. Um, it's really, and I, I think I'm hoping that young actors don't feel they need to go away; that they have all this on their doorstep, and you don't have to take that, uh, make that journey to London. Um, when there seems to be more, it seems yeah. to me uh, going on here. Um, this past year, I th I've done th four things here, and um, one of them isn't even set here. It was a, one of this Dalglish, um, uh, Inspector Dalglish. It's just on television at the minute, I, a small part, but it was shot here, you know, but set obviously in London and, or somewhere. Um, and uh, then another television um, 
thing, a new television thing I did, and then this Dinian last year. Uh, uh, and well, more recently, uh, in a thing in the West of Ireland, a film in the West of Ireland. But there's, and we, it, that was on Ackle Island, it was only finished a couple of weeks ago. And while we were on Ackle Island, there was another production, uh, Martin McDonough's latest film was being filmed there. So it's absolutely <laughs> covering this island. It's <laughs> everywhere you look, every corner, there's going to be a, a film crew. It's quite extraordinary. It's, it's amazing when you think there was probably never even a thought of anyone making a film on that island in you that landed there when there were two being made yes. <laughs> at the uh, same uh, time yeah. in this tiny rural community. Although f uh, 40 years ago, I, I was in a um, RTE BBC co-production, a television film called The Balmer of the Mance. And it was, we stayed in Ackle Island and it was shot in Ballycroy. And um, I fell in love with Ackle, completely fell in love with that place. And the after three weeks filming there, the bus was coming to take us to the station, to Castle Bar, to get the train. And the night before, I thought, I'm not getting on the bus. I'm going to stay here, and I'll find something to do. I'll work in the shop, any shop. <laughs> I'll, I'll just, I can't leave here. And, um, I, and I always thought I'd go back. And, but 40 years on, I go back, and the same thing happens to me yeah. again, where I think, I just can't leave here. It's so beautiful. And then I was very cheered to see that the artist Paul Henry, um, who I think was from here, when he went there in 1910 to Ackill, he uh, tore up his return ticket and stayed for 10 years. And so it's clearly a phenomenon. It's, it happens to people in Ackill. They just don't want to come back. And uh, it's lovely to see that sort of cultural revival that you can see the, the, the language, the scenery, the actors, you know, all of that, which I, I think is, you know, it's really heartwarming to see that massive revival and just people being proud, I suppose, almost of their Irishness. Yeah, I will. Uh, that the film Dinian, and because uh, it's not particularly an Irish story, no. but it is in the Irish language. And um, somebody was asking me that question actually. The Galway Fla, um, no, they asked everybody, all of us doing the Q and A, what sort of fil other films we'd like to see in Irish. And uh, I think Damien was saying horror. And but there, when you think of it, the range of films that could be made in Irish, and uh, everybody is. You know, okay. I think they're fine with subtitles. And not very long ago, I saw a film in Galician, um, which was about forest fires in Galicia, but it's actually about climate change, really. And I was thinking, well, that's a that'd be a, you could do a film, you know, really good f film about climate change and what we're up against in Irish. Why not in Irish? Yeah, I, the only thing I will say is obviously the, the male character in the film is meant to be a crime reporter, but it's actually quite well to do and as someone who has been reporting on crime for 20 <laughs> years I can assure you that that's not what the pay us you don't <laughs> you don't know massive houses in Dublin you well don't. You, I shouldn't I'm not giving away anything but of course he's not <laughs> yeah um, not really so what what next what for the future you've always said that you've thought I think I'm going to stop I think I'm going to stop but you keep going because you keep getting offered these roles um are you going to go on indefinitely until the roles stop coming in um well you know if you get offered things like Dinian, it's very, very hard. Uh, oh, it's not it's impossible to say no. I had actually last year, I think before Dinian started to think, I'm going to just start traveling more. I'm, um, I'd gone off to Spain for a few weeks in the winter was something I'd always wanted to do, but then I heard about it. And, um, and then of course we were all locked down. Um, uh, but I don't know, it is, it's very hard to, um, it's, it's very hard to, Say no to certain things, and um, um, I, I could, I, I could go into I fancy sort of a semi-retirement and travelling. And what I do love doing is reading, uh, yeah. reading poetry, and um, and you know from books, and I, that could be a sort of an easier, <laughs> slightly easier <laughs> life. But I do absolutely love film, and I, uh, I'd have to. My bluff would be called at any time a film, yeah. you know, and a really nice film comes up. It'd be very hard to say no. And you spoke about how originally you thought you might write. Is that something now you probably have maybe, if you had more time, it would be something that you would like to look at in the future? I, I think I missed the boat on yeah. that, really. You know, I think if I didn't start years ago, I don't think I'm going to do it because I haven't been doing it. And I, I just think I'm, it's too lonely for me, you know. And one of the things I actually really have valued about uh, theatre and film over the years is the companionship. And um, again, uh, talking about Dinian, um, we were all four of us uh, the characters those characters were locked down in the stormont hotel last year 
and uh, we sat at our separate, separate tables of an evening, masked, and then took our little masks off to eat. But I had so much fun with the, with the Peter and Claire and Sean T. And also, such enormous support. They're all Irish speakers. Yeah. But they were prepared to run and run lines with me and to support me. And they were just fantastic. And again, the longer I'm in this business, the best thing I take away from it is uh, just working with really good people and meeting new people. And um, it's really decent and funny people. Uh, it is the not, if you get that, that's the best thing about it. Actually, they, they must have been superbly lovely if you enjoyed being locked down in the storm <laughs> hotel. <laughs> well, you know, we we, we did we had a few we had, we had a very nice you time. You must introduce me to these people. <laughs> oh well, also I well I, the person I was our sort of saviour um, was a woman who's actually head of housekeeping at Stormont, uh, Phil, and um, but she was part of a skeleton staff there. Now it was empty when we went there. Yeah. It was completely empty. And uh, there was no drink served. And what? Um, yes, <laughs> there was no drink allowed. But Phil just <laughs> looked after us like her babies. She was the most wonderful woman. Um, and we all feel like we think there should be a statue erected <laughs> outside Stormont to Phil. Uh, right beside Carson? Just yes, put it no, no, take Carson <laughs> down and put Phil up there. That's what we, we think. Yeah. <laughs> well, we know why you're here. You're here, obviously, to receive an award. I am not important enough to be the person that gives you that award, but we do have someone very important sitting in the audience who is going to give you the award. I think Ma Michelle's going to come down. Yeah, um, we're absolutely thrilled bits to have Breed here today to give her an award for her outstanding contribution to Irish film. And we're really thrilled bits to be able to honour you tonight. So um, we're even more excited that Stephen Ray has joined us to present Breed with the award. So Stephen, if you'd like to come up with her, really give him a round of applause. No, uh, well, you couldn't be even more excited <laughs> than <laughs> this is Breed's Brennan. Um, do you know, she is one of our great, great actors. Uh, and it's wonderful to watch those clips, to see the focus of her uh, under the camera, and then to hear her talking about um, how she arrived at... Uh, the roles that she was doing. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, and she's kind of unique, you know. I've worked with her a lot. Uh, um, and it's I, my advice to actors, if they're in something, I watch Bridge, because uh, she will know what it's about. And it's not just about emotion, or it's tone. Uh, her tone is perfect. It's, it's a musical thing, you know. Um, She's, she's got the whole thing there. And if you keep watching her, it'll be fine. I did a thing with her once where the director tried to change her performance. And I looked at the director, remember? I, I won't name. <laughs> and I, and I, I just said, mistake, mistake. Because she's got it. She is, she, I can assure you, a tremendous, and um, one of my favorite actors in the world is Paul Schofield. And he was interviewed uh, for his biography, and they said to him, um, how would you like to be remembered? And he said, and this applies to Bridge, I think, he said, if you've got a family, that's how you'll be remembered. And I think that's true of you in your life. And that's what makes her work so beautiful because of her humanity. Give me the prize. <laughs> Not because you're out. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you got it. Why. So yeah, Here you are, so honey much. bunch. <laughs> well, hey. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody for coming, particularly as I have a lot of friends here who I'm sure are sick to death listening to all this stuff. And um, I haven't obviously made any sort of a speech. 
um, because I thought by this time you'll all be sick to death listening to me. But um, I, I just want to say about, it's a funny thing, I never ever imagined I'd get anything like this. And in the city where I was born and grew up, it means an enormous amount to me. I, as I was walking through the town today, I know I have that feeling when I walk through Belfast, sort of hoping somebody will go, oh, bridge, oh, hi, bridge. And it's uh, just you wanting that recognition after years and years of, well, I, I feel this is that thing. It's really a wonderful recognition, and I'm very, very grateful. I'm very moved by this. Um, I can retire now. I'm just, <laughs> it's, it's beautiful, and it <laughs> it's, it's a really beautiful thing, and I'm very fond of birds, and particularly owls, so thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Stephen, for those words. And thank you, everybody, very much. Thank you for coming.